I want to talk about Rosh Hashanah, which means the head of the year. All it means is the head of the year. It's the Jewish New Year. What does that mean to you? Probably nothing. But what it means to the world is that there's been a contiguous civilization for almost 6,000 years. Despite all of the adversity, there are those amongst the Jewish people who have maintained the traditions and kept them alive. Almost 6,000 years of the traditions of the Jewish people. So when you say Judeo-Christianity or Judeo-Christian society, I think you need to study a little bit more about what the word Rosh Hashanah means. It's actually a very happy holiday. It just means the head of the year. And what it means to the religious out there, Christians or Jews, it reaffirms the special relationship between God and mankind. It makes us remember that we are dependent upon God as our sustainer and creator. But it also reminds us that God is dependent upon us because it's we who make his presence known and we who make his presence felt in the world. Without us, God could not exist on this planet. So it's a very big two-way street. Now, what happens on Rosh Hashanah is very important to the believers. This begins what are known as the 10 days of awe. What happens between Rosh Hashanah, which is a happy celebratory holiday, ends on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the day of fasting, where people beg God for their forgiveness for all the sins they have committed or might have committed or would commit or whatever. It's a very heavy day, a very sad day. But during this 10 days, known as the 10 days of awe, Jews believe that all people of the world pass before God like a flock of sheep. And in heaven, in the court of heaven, it's decided who shall live and who shall die, who shall be impoverished and who shall be enriched, who shall fall and who shall rise. So religious Jews might have been seen going to a body of water. That could be a lake, a river, just a body of water. And they go and they throw bread upon the water. Many songs and poems are written about that. And what the religious Jews do is they throw bread into the water where there are fish. Because water symbolizes kindness, and fish have an ever-open eye, which corresponds to the 13 divine attributes that God has commanded us to follow. And so we're supposed to throw bread into water where there, is living, where there are living fish. And then they say a simple prayer. And, and please indulge me for a minute, because I want you to listen to how political this religious prayer is that is said today during the Tashlich prayer. You'll see how political religion has become. The prayer goes like this, Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and forgives transgression? For the remnant of his heritage, he does not maintain his wrath forever, for he desires to do kindness. He will again show his mercy. He will suppress our iniquities. And you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Show faithfulness to Jacob, kindness to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from the days of yore. From out of distress I called to God. With a bounding relief, God answered me. The Lord is with me, I do not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me among my helpers, and I will see the downfall of my enemies. And it concludes with these two prayers. It is better to rely on the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to rely on the Lord than to trust in nobles. The last phrase is of particular importance to people who are extremely political. Never, ever trust a politician. It was taught to us from biblical times. They are not to be trusted. It is better to rely on the Lord than to trust in nobles. Do you understand that? So that's one of the foundations of this Rosh Hashanah holiday, that you may see religious Jews in your neighborhood not know what they're doing with the black outfits, throwing bread in the water. You think they're nuts, Meshuggah, what are they doing? Another one of the uh, elements of Rosh Hashanah is the sounding of the ram's horn in temples around the world at sundown. And it has a certain sound. Neil, will you play that one now? This is the sound of the shofar, which is read in temple after the reading of the Torah. Can we hear that, please? What that is, is an attempt to awaken the congregants from their slumber, awaken them to the fact that another year has passed and another year is about to begin. But more than that, in my interpretation, it's a very deeply mystical uh, sound, the blowing of the ram, ram's horn. The mystics, the Jewish mystics who study the Kabbalah, believe that angels are formed from the blowing of the ram's horn. And these sounds, the Tekiah and the Shevarim, the Teruah and the Tekiah, 
All of these sounds, all of these sounds ask the angels to intercede favorably on our behalf to atone for all of our sins. And we're asking God to hear our voice, to help us live in kindness, no matter what has been done to us, no matter what, what has befallen us this day or the day before, whether it be physical or financial or personal or in your love life or you lost a mother or a father or a child. You're saying to God, I still love you. I understand that I rejoice in your word like one who finds greatness anywhere. And thank you for giving me the wisdom to understand you, God, because it takes great wisdom to understand God. It's not that easy to understand God. In fact, in an age of cynicism, it's very difficult to show any belief in God. People are very cynical today. But you should understand that many people around the world, Jewish or Christian or other religious people, have called to God in their days of distress, and they can tell you over and over again with absolute certainty that God answered their prayers. I'm not going to go into a schmaltzy story about my life, but it happened. It happened, and it's very important that I tell you that I personally know that God exists precisely because we can't see him, he exists. That's what human beings need. And so therefore, as I say to you, religion is paramount to our society and to our civilization. And so since the primitives who believe in religion amongst the Jews, beginning with Rosh Hashanah and the 10 days of awe, they believe even the most cynical actually probably has a semblance of remembering of being a child during which the father may have said to him, mind your stepson, you're entering God's temple, and over the next 10 days, God is going to judge you whether you're written into the book of life. Like, oh, man, okay, I don't want to, I'm young, I'm eight years old, I don't want to be wiped out. You know, watch your step, you blow that nose, you brush those teeth, you do your homework, you don't tell any lies, you polish that apple for your teacher, you know, do everything right over these next 10 days because God is watching. So the child, you know, believes in that. You know, then you become a man, you become cynical. Ah, who believes in that? That's for a kid. And yet there's an awful lot of adults who actually believe God is watching them in these days. So they do certain rituals. They blow the shofar. And they say, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has granted us life, sustained us, enabled us to reach this occasion. Well, what does that mean? What do you mean God has granted us life? What do you mean sustained us? Isn't it welfare and food stamps that sustain us? What do you mean God has enabled us to reach this occasion? Well, to some it is, but to most there actually is a God. And they do ask God to inscribe them in the book of life. But what's a very interesting fact that you don't know is that during the Rosh Hashanah period, when the men are praying and the women are praying, they say in Hebrew, remember us for life, inscribe us in the book of life for your sake, O living God, so you're saying to God, for your sake, inscribe us in the book of life. What does that mean? Why would God want us to be in the book of life? Why does he want us to live, not to die? I say this is one of the most important questions that I as a spiritual man could answer on the radio from my perspective. Am I a rabbi? No. Am I a holy man? No. Am I asking for a donation? No. Am I selling you a survival item uh, to cash in on it? No. Am I selling you a savage Bible? No. I'm giving you one man's interpretation of that very meaningful prayer where the religious man says, God, inscribe us in the book of life for your sake. Why do they say for your sake? Why is it for God's sake they would want to inscribe us? Because without man, God could not exist on this planet. Do you understand that? And do you know how that differentiates us from the atheists? As good as they may be, some atheists, and as wonderful they may be, and as great shepherds they may be of the earth, they don't even understand what they're doing in the big picture. In other words, the atheistic nature lover would say, I'm as good as you, if not better, because I protect the environment. What they don't understand is that a plant cannot worship God. The animal who I may love cannot worship God. My dog who I love very much cannot worship God. The eagle cannot worship God. The hawk that I love to look at as he flies over the trees cannot worship God. But I can. And so, in other words, for God to, to exist on this planet, we have to be here. So for the sake of God, we ask him to inscribe us in the book of life. And that's my revelation. I'm Michael Savage. I'll be right back.